So I hope you have the same respect that you did there. Jake, put your hand out. Put your hand out. Thanks. There'll be time for questions later. I'm going to turn the microphone right over to Ms. Squires and Ms. Leverage. Um, thank you again to Mr. Spitz and Mrs. Spitz for attending today. It's always great to have a little different learning experience. And I think you guys are going to learn a lot. So without further ado, thank you. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Justina Leverich, and along with Kat Squires, uh, we teach eighth grade English language arts here at the junior high. And as part of the eighth grade curriculum uh, in the ELA and social studies classes, uh, we teach our students about the Holocaust. And this morning, we are very, very honored to have with us two survivors, Mr. and Mrs. Spitz, uh, with us and share a first person account of the experience. Uh, we're also well aware that these precious opportunities to hear from survivors are vanishing. So the significance of this day is not lost on us, and we're grateful and honored to be in your presence. Thank you for being here. For this morning, Mr. Spitz has prepared a presentation and will be sharing his story with us. The presentation and PowerPoint will take about 45 minutes, after which we will have time for a Q&A session. I'd like to remind the audience that all cell phones must be silenced. So everybody, please take a moment and do that now. Thank you. And then also eighth grade, just a reminder that we will give our presenter our respect and our full and undivided attention. So please remain quiet throughout the presentation and then save your questions for the Q&A. We have nothing but the highest expectations for each of you. Uh, so once again, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Spitz, for your time this morning. We really, really appreciate you. My name, you see my name on the uh, monitor, and uh, I survived Holocaust as 15 years old, uh, and Noemi was 22 months. months old, which means that it's uh, 14 years difference, but we still had to survive really an attempt to murder us for about no emissions all her life and I've been there for three years but five years of Nazi rule uh, it's a lot of uh, art in that slideshow some of the samples are uh, on the right hand side of you and I will explain in the uh, the Q&A session if you ask a question. Uh, who was that time at the end of the war? 30 years old would be now 113. You know, not too many of those people come to talk to you. I was 15, which was, I'm only 93. <laughs> uh, we lived like you live, safely, no problems, no political or or racial or conflicts, uh, religious conflicts. Czechoslovakia was a democracy, something really close to American life. Uh, and uh, the country we came from, we both were born in was Czechoslovakia. You see it in red in the middle of Europe. And on the left hand side, you see Germany, on the right hand side, Soviet Union, and there are lots of countries around. Uh, neutral countries, new, neutral countries are are on uh, in white, and the others have different colors. Uh, as I said, you know, it was no really problem to live there, uh, considering any you know conflicts. Uh, as a child, I was a child in school. Uh, 
the village I was born uh, in was close to the Polish border, in the very north, in the very high mountains. You see those two pictures, and uh, even if they show green grass, in the front, in, in the mountains, you can see snow, which means it was very cold, uh, almost uh, eight to ten months snow on the ground, summer days, ten summer days, very few agricultural activity, but uh, just lumber and uh, potatoes, cabbage as food. Uh, this is a school I went to because I was able to, six years old, go to the first class and, and uh, spent five years in school, regular school. Uh, the city or town, or we would call it here, village, had only 2,000 people, which and about 10% about of them were Jewish people. And uh, it was uh, not, not enough uh, uh, students for a Jewish school, which means that I attended a regular school uh, as, uh, as anybody else. There were about 40 to 60 people in each class, and in my class there were only two Jews, so about 50 students. As uh, these were my parents. On the right hand side, my father was a Jewish cantor, something like a clergyman who took care of uh, about 100 families, uh, the congregation, uh, weddings, funerals, uh, religious services in synagogue and so on. Uh, in the middle is my mother who was a teacher on the top is my older brother, two years older brother, and next to my father is my eight, two years younger sister. We were three children. I'm on the extreme left in you know, this picture, about seven years old. Uh, we didn't know too much about Judaism, only what we learned at school or synagogue. And uh, it was a surprise to us how very few Jews are on this planet. Uh, about half of humankind is made of Christians and Muslims, 50%. But Jews are only 0.2%, which means that to one Jew there are about 530 other people on this planet. One to 530 is incredibly tiny number of, of considering uh, like numbers. Uh, in spite of the tiny, tiny uh, tribe or relig religious uh, affiliation and so on, Jews were extremely visible, very successful in practically every uh, enterprise or activity of humans made. And uh, Hitler knew it, Nazis knew it, and people, a lot of people all over the world envy that little tiny group of their success. Churchill, who didn't, was not really a good friend of Jews, even admired Jews as something remarkable, because to survive 4,000 years of very turbulent history was not only an achievement, but some kind of a miracle. Uh, our next door neighbor was Germany. Germany was also a democratic country, also very nice people. There was not more anti-Semitism than anywhere else, no hatred, no nothing. But a, a political party took over called Nazi Party, Nazi stood for National Socialism. And uh, it was a leader of, or ideologue of the uh, nation, it was in an economic crisis. People were upset, people were unhappy, and they started blaming the tiny, tiny minority, about 2% of the population, uh, to cause it. And uh, it ended up in a putsch. You know, he tried to, to go take over government. Hitler was in prison, and in prison in 1924, he wrote a book. You see the book on the screen 
called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle in German. And uh, he just built his career on uh, claiming that Germans are better people than others and Jews are guilty of anything which is rotten, bad, negative on this planet. Uh, the book was issued in 1925 and I was lucky that my parents read it. They were working at that time in what is called now Israel or Palestine. And uh, it was that kind of time called British Mandate Palestine because British were in charge of the country, of that area. Before 400 years, uh, Turks, Ottoman Empire ruled that country, that territory. It was very neglected, almost nobody lived there. Uh, a German historian described Jewish history in this way. There are three sentences you can see. And on the right hand side, in the red, uh, are the points of it. Uh, you may not live amongst us as Jews. Uh, this was a lot of times in his Jewish history that the Jews were expelled from uh, countries because they were so outstanding and so successful that it was very profitable to rob them of their property and kick them out. Which means that if they converted, they could stay, but as Jews, they were not allowed to stay in the country. If you look at the same sentence, it could be shortened to, you cannot live among us. You can live somewhere else, but not here. And Germans, or the Nazi, Nazi Germans, Nazi Germany or the Nazi movement shortened in that sentence and they tried to uh, get rid of this planet of the Jews by saying you may not live. Not live means murder. And this is what the book Mein Kampf advocated and the book was very popular and Hitler became a chancellor of a uh, chancellor meant like a prime minister or president or simply leader or supreme leader of the country. And in 1933, he was able to implement this ideology or this idea of uh, wiping out people from this planet as a really political, uh, economic and military movement. Uh, he, he, besides Jews, he wanted to get rid of Slavic people you know, kill all Poles and Russians who were Slavic and uh, clear the territory for a German race. His whole uh, philosophy was racial philosophy. Everything was based on race. And uh, naturally, uh, colored people, Africans, or, or uh, black people or simply even in between all the shades were totally out of the question and he wanted to repopulate the world with blue-eyed and uh, blonde people and kill practically everybody else some of them were sterilized not to have children uh, and used for as labor labor uh, until they just would be their way in 1938 uh, came a test. Uh, he, he was in power already for five years. He could control practically everything. He gave order to uh, break into Hitler, already controlled Austria. And uh, he gave orders to break uh, thousands of Jewish businesses uh, that's why it was called Kristallnacht, because in German Kristall means glass, and it was so much broken glass, like windows, uh, uh, glass windows, that it, the whole event got its name out of, from, from it. And uh, you see all those pictures burning synagogues, uh, hundreds of synagogues were burned. Uh, 
and about 30,000 unsuspected civilians who just were Jewish by religion were taken into concentration camps. It was totally unprecedented and uh, the world was silent and everybody confused or paralyzed or didn't care at all what was happening. This happened in Germany and Austria in those countries. Uh, and it was an eye-opener for us because we were next door neighbor in Czechoslovakia. We still felt, felt safe because our government uh, was against uh, German aggression. You know, Czechoslovakia was Czechs and Slovaks as were Slavic people. And they were, according to Mein Kampf, Hitler's book on the list to be exterminated, to be wiped out, to be culturally uh, destroyed. Some people would be taken out, which looked a little bit more, what they call, aliens. But otherwise, uh, they didn't have any future in the next world where Nazis would have succeeded. Uh, British, uh, Hitler, Hitler demanded minorities, very similar to what you see now in Ukraine. He requested uh, or demanded from powers of, in Europe uh, that he would live in peace and he would not be aggressive if he receives minorities in countries uh, like Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, Chamberlain, who was Prime Minister of England, uh, combined with French people, betrayed Czechoslovakia and eventually uh, agreed with Hitler's demands and believe that they saved peace of Europe for another hundred years. This is how it looked. There's very dark purple around, on the left hand side around Czech, what was Czechoslovakia, there are two countries, two nations, two languages, and on the left are Czechs, Bohemians sometimes, what they're called. The purple, dark purple shows where German minority lived. They spoke both uh, Czech and German, and they, uh, Hitler demanded to attach this part to Germany and the uh, Chamberlain agreed. Czechoslovakia had to give up their resistance in army. And after Germans took the dark purple part, which was around the uh, borders, uh, they took the base part as well and Czech, Czechs just vanished from the map and became part of Germany, they call it protectorate, they protected so-called the territory of the people there. Slovakia, which is here in blue, became a Nazi ally, uh, fascist Slovak Republic with separatists who were very happy to have their own country, their own president, and uh, they didn't, un they didn't uh, realize that they were on the list of Slavic people as well. They would vanish or would be just, just ch kids would be taken to learn German and they would vanish from, from history completely. But this is what happened to the country where we lived. Uh, here is on the right hand side President of Slovakia. He was a Catholic priest by profession because he was the only people who were literate, who, who had some education and entered politics. On the right hand side, shaking hand with Hitler, who is on the left hand side. And uh, it was a really a perfect match because both of them were anti Semitic and both of them didn't want to uh, have uh, any other uh, races or nations to rule or simply participate in the rule of the country. Uh, this is a picture showing our fear, our confusion, because we were about 2% of minorities, you know, in one room there are 100 people, and two people are missing, nobody notices too much, which means it was not critical for the country or for the population to notice that there are some injustice done to such a tiny minority. 
Uh, this is a picture showing, like again, uh, you know, people didn't know any answer, nobody could forecast any future, nobody knew anything uh, happening, what would, what, what would follow. Uh, and uh, the people, you know, in very fictitious spaces, consulting with a bird, maybe the bird knows something. And we felt like this, you know, like squeezed between two beasts and it was a slight movement and that beast would just turn around and, and murder that person behind. Uh, very quickly, uh, Slovakia accepted uh, the, that uh, same method of scaring the population or re-educating the population in hatred. They were demonstrations, you know, like a, uh, uh, like you see on this picture, uh, they were people shouting on the streets, throwing stones into uh, windows of Jewish uh, apartments or homes and so on. Which means that this was like education of people in hatred preparing to annihilate this little tiny minority. Uh, I was 10 years old, you are now about what, 14, something like that, 15. I was 10 years old when they kicked me out of school because we are not allowed anymore to attend public schools. And here is that uh, class, huge class. I'm on the top with an X over my head on the, the photograph. And this is where my education ended up for four, for, for four five years. Uh, we had to wear a yellow star. Slova in Slovakia, it was nothing on it, just a yellow, about four inches in diameter. In Czech lands, it was a Jude written on it because it was a Germany already. On the left hand side were stars worn by the Jews who were important for the economy as they wouldn't, uh, they, would, they were protected from deportations and from from anything because they were important for the economy. And naturally, it was very temporary, and later on, there were no rules for that, or exceptions for that. Uh, again, here you see propaganda, can you imagine, being accused of uh, murdering not only people, but gods, spreading diseases, you know, poisoning wells, and so nobody died. Uh, nobody was poisoned, but they were telling the Jews are kidnapping kids and uh, murdering them and things like that. And it was also in school books. In every child was aware of it through through books, through through e exams in, in their history or whatever subject it was. Uh, anyway, here you sh you see paintings showing frustrations and fear and abandonment because the world really did not care. Nobody really uh, kept our side and everybody lived a regular, normal life, uh, not only in our country, but all over. Uh, we had to produce a Jewish school because they didn't want the Jewish kids running around and do mischief, maybe stealing or doing all kinds of stuff. And it was such a t tiny, tiny village, uh, eventually it was a county seat, which means that we called it town or city or whatever, but 2,000 people only in the middle of the mountains, very high mountains. And uh, there were 24 kids of that town. Uh, and we all squeezed into one room and it was a school and students were between the age of 6 and 14. Uh, practically none of them survived the following, uh, following year. This is how in 1942 Europe looked. What, is, what you see in yellow color is practically uh, taken uh, over by German government and the secret police and the murders, murderers, which were usually SS troops. I don't know if you have heard that term. Uh, 
And uh, they were already all over Europe, on the border of Soviet Union, inside of the Soviet Union, <laughs> already uh, touching uh, Moscow and Stalingrad on, on in the east, and having practically all West and South Europe under their command, uh, and also in North Africa, you see a little bit lower uh, the yellow part in Africa, uh, across Mediterranean, they were already there. Which means that it looked like uh, they are going to win the war. Uh, America had their own problems. Uh, Pearl Harbor already happened, but it was far away, uh, not in Europe. And uh, we felt really truly lost. You know, that little green spot in the middle is Slovakia with the arrow showing it. And this is where we lived. It was thousands of miles in all directions, which means it was nowhere to run, to hide or to protect ourselves or to escape from the rule which uh, nobody believed that Hitler might murder so many millions of people. At that time there were 11 million Jews under Nazi jurisdiction and all were sentenced to death, but people just laughed at it. How can you murder 11 million people? Uh, today it's possible because we have nuclear weapons and we have biological weapons and we can imagine it because it already happened. But that time it was a fantasy, you know, like political bluff. He was threatening with something he couldn't do. And he was able to do it and we learned uh, in a hard way that he really did uh, commit that what was later called genocide, it did, the term didn't exist. But it was a mass murder of civilians and human beings. Here is a Slovak president who is showing even a Nazi greeting, uh, what, uh, that he is really a very strong ally of Nazi Germany. His army was fighting with Nazis, the Nazi army, the German army all over the world, in the East, the Russians against Soviet Union, in the West against West, and in the South against uh, the army which was trying to resist or, uh, or g gave up. Uh, in a, uh, the Slovak government, Slovak government decided to deport the Jews abroad uh, under the, uh, some kind of an excuse of labor. They wanted to move part of the population to labor camps. At least they claimed to do that. Uh, which means that this is a painting of families on the right hand side, uh, more religious, uh, like based on the dresses and so on. And uh, here how deportations abroad to labor camps was organized. They started with 16 years old girls uh, who were preparing accommodations, barracks and so on. Then they sent uh, military uh, age males, like boys, uh, after them. It was all made by psychologists not to cause panic, to make it really legal, to make it really very humane and normal. Uh, and uh, then after some with old people, like you see here, waiting with these yellow stars on their chests, it's from a book, photographs. And uh, they started moving really uh, about 80,000 Jew Slovak Jews to the so-called labor camps. Uh, on this map, it, this map is showing uh, Poland, which was a neighboring country in the north, Slovakia is in blue, in light, and uh, we lived on the almost on the border of Poland. Uh, and uh, what became a very famous uh, town, Auschwitz, uh, you know, labor, labor camp, uh, as well as extermination camp, they called it, death camp, where people were coming. Uh, to be murdered, 
few people were taken out of the transport and the rest was just murdered, uh, told to undress to be disinfected before they would be employed or taken into those uh, manufacturing facilities. And uh, the gas came and murdered them. Here it is even uh, better shown uh, in green and with the arrow how close to Auschwitz we lived, about 50 miles or something like that, uh, one hour by train. Somebody escaped from there and uh, was put in prison because they believed they were smugglers. There were a lot of smugglers on the border area. And they, uh, we helped them out of prison and hid them. And uh, they told us that they escaped from the uh, labor camp Auschwitz. That's why, uh, no, they didn't advertise it, which means that it was all secret. There were thousands of villages, thousands of camps like that. Uh, but this was so close and so huge. Uh, and uh, every two hours people were coming, uh, 2,000 or 1,000, 2,000 people coming by train. And they were just told, uh, so that they sorted them out, took some stronger, younger people uh, who survived a few months of labor because they gave them 600 calories. Uh, for hard labor and naturally they got sick and, and they were dead in a few months. But the rest of the population, females, males, kids, old people, uh, they just took, uh, they, they just uh, asked to disinfect and murder them, kill them by gas and then uh, prisoners burn their bodies in crematoria. Which means that they told us something like that, which was that time totally inconceivable, totally unbelievable. Nobody could believe that anybody in civilized Europe can do it. Germans used to be extremely cultural country, the most advanced technologically, the best engineers in the world, inventors. Uh, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, Schiller, Goethe, you know, the writers, uh, poets, and so on. Which means nobody could believe that a nation like that could uh, uh, become a nation of executioners, and it still happened. A lot of people believe that if you are nice, uh, then you will have a nice reaction. If you uh, don't want to eat a lion, hungry lion wouldn't eat you. Uh, you know, this was some kind of an education in uh, tolerance and love and reciprocity and, and balance and so on. Which means that it, this is how I was educated. Uh, and you probably are too. You don't expect somebody to be nasty to you if you are nice to them. Uh, and it was a bad mistake. And, and another bad mistake was that in our country, a priest was a president and nobody would expect a priest to send some civilians, ch children, females, uh, women to girls to, to be murdered. Uh, and it fooled a lot of people as well. I was 12 when those deportations were coming, when I found out that I'm a target to be murdered. Uh, a year before that, uh, uh, the same same year, my grandparents were deported, my aunts, uncles were deported. These are my mother's relatives, closest relatives, like siblings and parents. This is my father's. My father had seven siblings. Uh, his family is my cousins, many cousins, and they were all taken to those camps and they vanished. But at that time, it was not too, too, many, too many ways of communication, like a radio, it was no television. Uh, very, only very rich people had the radios, and the telephone was uh, one or two, almost were in the 2,000 people's town where we lived. There's a county seat, there's offices and all kinds of, we had to go to a post office to give a call and tell them you know, wait them for an hour or two until they connected us. 
which means that the communications were really terrible. And uh, this picture shows a wedding of my sister's wedding. My mother is on the extreme right. She was the only survivor. Her 21 years old sister is getting married in 1920, 1941. And in 1942, she was taken to those, those labor camps and murdered uh, within a few weeks or months. And she was young, 21, she was uh, able to labor. And this was an extermination camp, like they called it. Extermination is a term used for insects or, or, or rodents, uh, harmful uh, creatures which had to be uh, get, uh, wiped out from human societies because they are harmful. Uh, this is a school, uh, we had that a school where we, children between the age of 6 to 14, uh, all those deported children from this group were murdered at the arrival, which means that none of them survived. One of them made it another two years because he was a pharmacist, pharmacists were excluded from from uh, deportation and then at the end of the war, I tell you what happened, uh, all the rules of exceptions were cancelled because frontline clothes came close and they were hiding like we were hiding, that's why I'm still alive. And uh, they found them in a forest, found him with his mother in the forest shot them, killed them. She means that he was 14 when he was killed. He was the last survivor of that group. They were a people, they were young people older than 14. And here on this picture, they were the youth of that little county seat town. And none of them survived the war, which means they all were murdered, directly murdered. Uh, Nobody believes at the time that uh, somebody could just take a person, <laughs> you know, and murder uh, them legally, factory style, you know, like almost 10 to 15,000 people a day in one location, and there were many locations. Because Germans, uh, as I said, inherited 11 million Jews in, on their territory, Soviet Union, a very good, great, huge piece of Soviet Union huge territory in Poland and uh, West Europe and they were all destined to be murdered to the last baby. One day old baby would be murdered. Uh, naturally we felt uh, uh, terrible by knowing no, those people who we, we uh, saved or be interrogated or be we had to hide for about 10 days because police were searching for them they were sitting they were, they were, we were talking to them for about 10 days more than a week and the first three days we didn't believe them you know my mother was telling them you don't have to exaggerate we are going to we are going to help you anyway don't worry uh, don't tell us the truth. And they say, no, this is the truth. This are, are telling you they are killing people like that. They could kill 10 to 15, 10 to 15 uh, thousand people a day. And uh, it took them three days to convince us. And you see me alive because we believed it and tried to tell other people, you know, don't go to those cattle cars. Don't go to those deportations to the labor, so-called labor camps. They are not labor camps, they are death camps. People didn't believe us. But only those who believed us uh, survived because they started hiding, running around, uh, country to country, forest to forest, and they survived the war as we did. Uh, this is a, a two painting showing like a desperate people because we were trapped. And uh, Germans were so strong and, and so powerful and their armies took over the whole Europe and uh, the big piece of Soviet Union. Uh, America was not yet in the picture, uh, you know, like uh, D-Day and uh, all those things came uh, in one or two years later. Uh, this is something uh, I wanted to remind people who 
uh, have uh, averse uh, feelings towards the Jews because it is still prevailing that some people who envy Jews or hate the Jews or heard uh, all kinds of propaganda. Just as a little reminder that Jesus, who is a, a part of Godhead in Krishna religion, was Jewish. He never converted to any other religion. And uh, if he lived in Slovakia or anywhere in Europe under the Nazi jurisdiction, he would have been taken to a, a death camp and uh, treated as a Jew, murdered as a Jew with his parents, with his siblings, with his followers, with apostles, with people who wrote the Gospels and wrote the Bible, which means that it's all ridiculous uh, to hate the Jews because we practically all came uh, and believe in religions based on Judaism. This is the same same idea uh, which uh, sometimes I give the whole lecture only on this subject. We had only in 1944 uh, the front line came back, came uh, re reversed because Soviet Union started fighting back. America entered the war, started helping Soviet Union with equipment and arms, something like you, you can uh, see now Ukraine, you know, one superpower supporting the other one, and one country is against, one is for, and so on. Which means that this way, uh, uh, the balance of power started changing in German started, German Nazi, German army started losing the ground. Uh, they were always threatening the world with secret weapon, which means that something like nuclear weapons. And they said, you know, from one day to another we would uh, reverse, uh, we would win and uh, kill our enemies and so on. But they were not successful. Churchill was able to stop them from uh, producing that very powerful nuclear weapons and uh, when Americans worked on it and eventually almost after the war in Europe uh, they were able to use it but Germans never did and that's why they lost, lost the war but in 1944, one year before the end of the war uh, they were still very powerful and they moved to the border of Czechoslovakia. And Slovakia was in the east, which means that we were first and Czechs were the next, next uh, to the west, towards the west. Uh, we had only three choices. Either join uh, passively, walk into those cattle cars, uh, you know, be uh, imprisoned in a, uh, the death camp or labor camp, and, and just plainly die, either immediately or a few months later, being exhausted and sick and diseases and starvation. Second, you know, my brother was very smart and he, he, he was thinking how to, how to get out of it. Second part was, uh, you know, uh, how to, how, uh, some resist resist uh, those. But whoever resisted enters a cattle car or being deported was, was shot on the spot. This was a third, time, third way. And so the second way, the third way was to run away, hide, and against all odds, because we were surrounded from all sides, somehow to, to save ourselves regardless of the surrounding, which was totally against us totally uh, against all odds, you know, like if you didn't have strong faith, common sense would tell you that you are done, uh, and, and not that you have hope to uh, survive or to do something to save yourself. Uh, my brother was very smart, without him we would not have survived it, he was two years old, uh, they call him genius because after the war and so on. But he said, you know, we could have we, we could have purchased false identity papers pretending not to be Jewish. And we didn't have, first of all, we didn't have money. Secondly, the town was 2,000 people. Everybody knew us. We couldn't uh, escape, you know, easily. 
the, 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 this was uh, one way. Second way would be fly away somehow, but it was a war, we would be shut down. Even if we had a gl glider, how far would we fly? Thousands of miles in all directions. We didn't know how to breathe underwater. We would be night hiding underwater, but we didn't know how to breathe there. But my brother came to a conclusion that what we can do is to live in a forest like furry animals, they survive winters, they survive snow, they survive all kinds of bad conditions, weather, even hunters. Uh, not all of them, but they, many of them survive, which means that this, we, we could be, try to live like, like uh, uh, the wild animals in the forest, like deer, bear, uh, foxes, and so on. Which means that this is what we adopted as a way of trying to stay alive. And he saw to the smallest detail how to do it. Uh, when the front line really came close and uh, Gestapo, which was secret police, searching for every Jew, they had a list of everybody for, for already and uh, they were just systematically wiping out Jewish population wherever they took over. Uh, when they came too close and they took over Slovakia, uh, then we ran away into the forest. Uh, Jewish communities were already gone, there were only few Jews left, left in each community, in each uh, location, but they were still there because of government needed them, or the industry needed them, or some uh, health organizations needed them. Or they were resisting and zigzagging as we did, uh, you know, pretending here and there, you know, able to live under very inhuman conditions. Uh, this is how the forest in northern Slovakia where we lived. This is how it looks. This is an area of photography of the area. I found it somewhere in the, uh, and uh, it was practically. Uh, representing the area where we lived. Uh, where you see the green grass and so on, there were sheep, some cows, and very little horses. Genghis Khan left there 600 years before. Uh, those horses were very small, very resistant, could live in a, you know, 10 months of snow that covered uh, uh, forests uh, pulling those logs of cutting trees, which was the only industry there. And uh, cheese from the sheep uh, made people uh, just survive. Uh, we, this is what we have chosen, you see on the red hand side, the red arrow, to build a shelter. This is how we built it. One of those pictures uh, you see real ones on, on the easel on the left hand side is showing how we built it. We, we just, what you see the yellow part on the left top picture, we cut, we cut out the dirt from the side of a, of a uh, side of a hill, steep hill. On the bottom of it was a little creek uh, eventually a stream of water, maybe one, two feet, depending on rain or moisture in the area. And uh, we uh, took uh, some wood, which fallen trees, tree trunks, uh, lying around in the forest, built a skeleton, inserted it into the triangle, camouflaged it, as you see uh, on this picture. Um, and while they, in the background you see those horses, they were eventually uh, patrols searching for us because we vanished from the town and uh, they knew we existed. And we vanished from the village which was close by and they knew which directions we, we vanished and they tried to find out and kill us. And they, uh, na and we were hiding successfully and they couldn't find us. This is how it looked in a fall, green grass, but in the mountains uh, you, you still see the snow. Uh, 
on, on the mountains. And this is how it looked in winter time. They had a very hard time, even on horsebacks. They couldn't use dogs because if the snow was one, two, three feet deep, a dog would just uh, vanish in the snow. He would not, could not run around and sniff us out. And uh, this is how hard it was to find us. But many people who had to go out uh, were murdered, and this is a painting uh, showing how they uh, were found in the forest and surrounded and murdered. Uh, here's another one. I brought that painting is in extreme right of the easel, in the easels. Uh, here is a painting which was showing when uh, already they could not take people away in railroad cars and they made those long marches and whoever became weak and, and stumbled or something, they shot him. Which means that there were those long marches and the dead bodies on the right hand side. Uh, eventually, a Red Army defeated the Nazis in a, in a spring of 1945. Uh, eventually, the Soviet Army, at the time it was called the Red Army, come, uh, even made it into Berlin, took over Germany. And uh, in April, they reached Slo Slovakia and we were able to get out of out of uh, that forest uh, and start a new life. We were almost, almost dead, but almost doesn't count. We were alive, Hitler committed suicide, and we returned to find out that there were no relatives left uh, alive, we found absolutely no relative who would have survived. My mother's parents, uh, sisters, my father's seven siblings, my cousins, uh, grandparents, all murdered. And we were weak, undernourished, I had tuberculosis after the war. Uh, every one of us was sick, but six of us made it because one grandparent, my father's father, spent in the forest with us and made it, we six of us made it alive. In Berlin, in the meantime, uh, American army came from the other side, and you see here his street, uh, you before uh, used Hitler's Strasse, Hitler's street, changing to Roosevelt Street. Uh, and uh, really, it took a while, but we, uh, waited it out and Hitler was dead and we were alive, which means that it was something to celebrate but we were in no mood to celebrate. Now how to integrate back into the society after five years of not going to school, uh, being uh, you know, called, uh, uh, being sentenced to death, three years on a death row more or less waiting until our turn comes to be murdered. Uh, there were, as I mentioned, 11 million Jews who were sentenced to death. This is the Eichmann's list showing uh, by nations, by countries, by areas uh, where Jews lived and really their objective was to absolutely uh, murder every, uh, even one hour old baby. Uh, wipe out that Jewish uh, ideology with the physically people physically carrying that, that religion and that conviction which uh, Nazis hated. Uh, people started coming out of those uh, survivors coming out and they confirmed exactly what those people uh, from Auschwitz told us. Uh, they were showing pictures of uh, those gas, gas uh, uh, chambers 
uh, pretending to be showers, uh, the gas which used to be to kill human beings, uh, crematoria, and uh, even open pits here in Opole and Sobibor, they just were machine gun people throwing them into pits, throwing, burning the bodies with some gasoline. And, uh, and then it became uh, covered with dirt and uh, grass, and now it's a forest or uh, totally unrecognizable, and there are thousands, ten thousand, hundred thousands of mass graves like this all over Europe, particularly Ukraine, Ukraine uh, Soviet Union, Poland, and so on and anywhere where they could reach it. Every one of those dead people had a name. Every one of them had a, had, was, was, was alive. Uh, and, uh, and among them were a million and a half children. A million and a half children murdered, brutally murdered. Uh, this is, uh, I took it from internet, it would take almost 12 years if, if you start reading their names. It's so many people, beyond imagination, beyond comprehension. I started painting, uh, you know what I remembered, my relatives like this. And, uh, you know, this was the only thing I could do, just to uh, let them remember them. And today I'm trying to share with you uh, those memories. These are carvings uh, showing like, uh, because they were all burned with flames, with fire, which means that this looks like a flame and it's a wood carving. Uh, I made uh, here the same, but this are in the form of a picture of people who were taken away fear in fear and murdered. Uh, this picture, I believe, is here too. Is here too. They were between the year 1940, 1945, five to six years of misery, of, of terrible feelings, of no perspective. Uh, if not for our faith that this could not possibly happen, and uh, Nazis couldn't possibly uh, succeed without that faith, we would have probably given up as well. After the war, on the left hand side I tried to paint a survivor, on the right hand side symbolically people falling into the flames but coming out of flames like a phoenix in a Greek mythology, uh, a bird which comes out of annihilation alive and renewed a re with a renewal of life. Uh, we try to rebuild our lives because the regular population just went on living. Uh, until today, I, re I didn't receive anything. This was a recognition of my status of homeless refugee because our, our apartment was taken and we didn't know where to go. We, they deprived us of any legal and human rights. And after the war, they gave us a... Uh, recognition of a refugee, a stateless, homeless refugee, and they gave me about ten dollars, and it's written on this uh, certificate, ten dollars, bar of soap, because from that forest we were terribly covered with clay and, and fungus and all those things, and a pair of shoes, because my shoes fell apart, which means that we lived in a communist country where I didn't receive any compensation from the West. Then we came to the West and uh, it was too late uh, to apply and, and uh, simply I got nothing, uh, no apology, no explanation uh, and no compensation until today. And I don't regret it because it made me stronger and not weaker. Naturally, we try to integrate into society, and before we were able to immigrate or to think of uh, leaving the country, uh, the communist government took over the borders, sealed it very tightly, and nothing 
and we couldn't couldn't leave anymore. So we said we tried to accommodate and um, uh, re-enter society. One of those pictures there is very similar to to that on the top. Uh, we started uh, enjoying, you know, living uh, music. Uh, education and so on. The communist government was not very kind to us after the war. Uh, properties confiscated from us, or even personal items uh, never returned. We were totally robbed and n never ever received any, uh, any e even thinking of some kind of compensation or returning of our own property. Uh, my brother uh, was an artist, he revolted against communist government and he lived only 33 years because uh, he was cowardly uh, irradiated by radioactive stuff, you might uh, have heard about it, how uh, Soviets used to do it, you know, murdering political opponents and it still continues. My father who practiced his he practiced religion and his profession uh, was also didn't even live 60 years, he went to the hospital with something trivial and never came out of it alive. I continued living, you know, I was 17, 18, 19. I uh, completed high school. Uh, graduated high school, this is the final, I even made a tableau, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I even continued in industry and made my PhD, became an engineer, chemical engineer, and then a scientist in a glass of ceramic engineering specializing in glass, in glass making which means that this was my profession and uh, the government did not have any reason to get rid of me, that's why I went on living. Uh, this is a graduation, first of all as an engineer in the same room I got my PhD in uh, ceramic engineering. In the, uh, I published a lot of scientific articles, had inventions, on, on the left hand side on the bottom are my patents, I had about a dozen of them, some of them my mother sent me when, after we escaped. Uh, I married finally in 1967, uh, about almost 40 years old because I was really very careful not to be caught, not to be called a saboteur of the socialist economy because there were no mistakes. The engineer made a mistake and it was not called mistake, it was called sabotaging the government, which means that I had to be extremely careful and didn't have even time for my personal life. Uh, but finally I married Noemi and uh, these are two weddings. One was civil wedding and the, the bottom was a religious wedding which was just allowed for a few months until the Soviet army came and, and, and complete and uh, for another 20 years, uh, uh, just blocked any attempt uh, to have any religious uh, uh, thoughts or, or, or exhibit any publicly any religious uh, uh, ideology or something like that. But we were lucky that it was just a few months. Uh, I was sent to Cuba because Cuban industry didn't work for three years and as they exhausted all other experts in the world uh, and they sent me to fix it. Uh, they gave me two years to fix it but they, when I arrived they told me you don't fix it in six weeks, six weeks, month and a half, uh, you are done. Which means that I understood the language, <laughs> you know, I was able to resist Nazis and the communists for 20 years, which means that I spoke that language and in six weeks first factory worked and in a few weeks the rest. Uh, and uh, you see me still alive. 
Uh, we, nine months later, we had an opportunity flying back to Cuba uh, to escape from an airplane. It came in, uh, down in Canada to refuel, and we were able to manage to escape. And uh, in a tropical suit, without luggage, we remained in Canada uh, and became so-called stateless refugees. We didn't have uh, anything on us, nobody, we knew nobody in Canada, nobody, no relatives, no friends, we had no money, we had about three dollars, and uh, not even a coat, and it was the middle of December, Friday 13, by the way, people consider it an unlucky day, it was our extremely lucky day, and uh, we remained in that country, and we moved eight times in Canada for nine years, uh, and for an, uh, then we moved to the United States, all job-related uh, moves. Uh, here is that uh, document called Travel Document, uh, which is showing a stateless uh, refugee, which uh, had been our document for five years because our passport wasn't good enough. It was a, just a passport for Cuba uh, to serve that uh, particular assignment or business trip. Uh, we became Canadian citizens first after five years and then moved to America after five years we became uh, American citizens and it already happened in Kingston 40 years ago uh, in 1983. Uh, I spent 30 years in glass industry but after 30 years in glass industry, I decided to uh, took a challenge. They needed a glass specialist to make a part which produced, uh, eventually produced a computer, a, a workable computer. And in case there was a company called National Micronetics. They hired me from New Jersey and uh, I spent 14 years with them until I became uh, 68 years old. Oh, here is that part we were producing and we were very successful. Uh, the company had about 1,400 employees and 90% of the world market, world market was buying our product. And at 68, uh, uh, I retired. And because I couldn't express my feelings, uh, and in a communist country, you know, talking about Holocaust was forbidden because the only heroes were Soviet fallen soldiers, uh, which means that, and I was too busy with my uh, with, with my profession because I had to learn English and in, and in Canada also French, uh, and so on, which means a new life completely different economy, ideology, life, completely different life, which means it took me a lot of uh, effort and time. And finally, when I retired, I became a full-time artist. And full-time artist, you see here those paintings, some of them were made while I was still working, and some, most of them uh, was a result of a full-time job which means an art of paintings like this, you know, nobody really painted anything like this because commercially who would buy a painting like that. And uh, I started exhibiting because people were interested in Holocaust uh, in Canada, the United States and in Europe. Uh, one of my first paintings was this, uh, you know, like uh, writing down 40 years of my experiences and a frustrated face on the left. This was one of the huge paintings in uh, showing like a, those people in this uh, to nowhere. The, here are ceramic pieces uh, combining sculptures with uh, paintings, all fired, all hard ceramics. Here are sculptures I made uh, paintings showing like sad landscapes, lamenting, you no know, faces. This uh, uh, kind of painting became very famous because uh, 150 years ago 
uh, impression is now a finished uh, a logical uh, development of impressionist paintings uh, exhausted my holocaust subjects I started painting anything which means that here is some music and some fantasies and some sculptures, stone sculptures in big uh, I became an honorary painting made it in the book and an art historian, which happens very few to very few artists. Uh, my paintings are in this book as well. Uh, we, we made our own book because during COVID uh, we were asked to write a book, which means as with Noemi we wrote this book and this is the cover page. Uh, uh, 2015, uh, Slovaks in Toronto made a movie. Uh, you can see when you type in Spitz DVD 01, it is a movie on YouTube, online, anybody can see it. It's a, um, one hour long in Slovak language, but English subtitles. And this is another movie I was in last year, 2022. PBS purchased that movie and broadcast it on 350 TV station channel 13 in this area uh, and it's still going on rather strongly because Amazon is selling it and all kinds of uh, the cultural organizations. I give lectures like this one. This one is in New Jersey, Drew University, where they have a genocide and Holocaust study for teachers even and they highly appreciated this slideshow which I was showing you. This is a Baruch College in Manhattan and I give about uh, 20 speeches a year, last year 21, uh, all over because it was the occasion of the movie where I was, uh, uh, you know, asked, uh, answered question question of it. Okay, this is the end of it. End of my show, showing that naive people, unsuspected people are usually victims. Anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews continues. Now it turns into hatred of Israel, state of Israel. And uh, you cannot do too much about people who are frustrated and try to blame somebody else. Uh, the question which you might ask in a moment is Holocaust, uh, can Holocaust be repeated or can genocide be repeated? Unfortunately, in the last few decades, yeah, the answer is yes, it's done. Okay, this is a reminder to not only Jews but to non-Jews. And uh, as my wife said, this is the end of my show. <laughs> she didn't speed it up too much. Uh, if you want to... Thank you very much. You can ask questions. And you can contact, you can contact me if you have additional questions. Okay guys, so we're gonna start the question and answer portion. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm gonna come around and I'll get the question from you and then I'll repeat it to Mr. Tibor. Okay, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. Originally, they were Slovak Nazis, uh, when truly they were called fascists, like Italian fascists, Duce, you know, Mussolini. Uh, but they were eventually having exactly the same ideology, and uh, they tried to, first of all, rob us. They were coming to our apartment, 
and taking whatever they wanted. They were beating people on the street. They were beating kids, Jewish kids on the street. We were at the Yellow Star. But there were a lot of good people also who helped us. That's why I'm alive. If I was good people, I would not. But uh, then we saw the German army uh, in Slovakia going into Poland. Uh, this is how the Second World War started. Three days later, after they already took some villages, Hitler said, oh, it's Pol Polish people attack Germans, we have to retaliate. <laughs> we saw <laughs> that they have been already a few days inside of Poland. And we saw the army, and, and uh, but later on, it was just uh, police uh, and uh, people who, because if somebody stopped you on the street, wearing that yellow star, and you talk to them, that person would get a ticket, and you would get a ticket, like a, like a, a, a car, you know, if you, if you uh, have a, a ticket for speeding, it was just forbidden to have contact with the local population. Uh, then, uh, when it's 1944, when we were in the forest, uh, we did, I did not see those people because this would be my last minute <laughs> of life. Uh, is it a good answer? No, I was 12 years old. I'd be killed within an hour uh, after arrival. Uh, so it didn't need 12 years. I, I was short, I'm still short. I didn't grow ever since. But I was a short, I looked probably like a nine, 10 years old, considering my size. Uh, and uh, I went to uh, Auschwitz and many other camps after the war as a tourist, as a person who uh, wanted to remind myself where my relatives were murdered. But it was not, it, I, during the war I was not. And this is a, a unique uh, case of survival, of survivors who did not go to uh, camps, who didn't survive the camps, survives outside of it. Very rare the fraction of percent of those who were murdered. She wants to know how many people knew where you were hiding when you were hiding? Maybe how many people were you with? Not a single person knew it. Because if a person who was innocent, they would not want to harm us, would walk through the forest and would uh, hear voices or see some traces uh, and would tell somebody, and that person would tell somebody, then they would know our location and because they were searching for us all those seven months. We were seven months under the ground and snow and ice in a forest. And people walked on the roof of the shelter. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can, you can see on the right-hand side bottom pictures of shelter. Uh, and they would know that we were underneath. And it was a war. At the end of the war, uh, Soviet soldiers, they called them Red Army, fought in that forest five times, over our heads, all around us. You know, it was a miracle that a bomb, a mortar shell or cannon shell didn't fall on, on the roof. Uh, we, were, we saw cartridges all over. Which means that if one person knew about our location, it would be our last day or, or last, last few days. No, nobody knew about it. And we did not have money to get help. We had to do digging and building ourselves, and we did.
wants to know what you ate when you were when you were hiding. What what kind of food did you eat? Uh, you know, I was I was very strong uh, as a young person with strong muscles, unusually strong, uh, and. Uh, I went in because of most of the time, you know, we came there in September and a few, about a month later, fell, snow fell, <coughs> fell and covered the area with about one foot, with drifting snow, about two feet of snow. I went to, and we were hiding. Nobody was supposed to find out our location because they might, uh, uh, without any bad intentions, might reveal our location, which would be the end of it, because we're searching for us on horseback. And uh, uh, to search for food, uh, winters came to the area from one moment to another. There were no fall or spring. It was just winter and then a few days of summer and then back, back to winter. Very high in the mountains. And, uh, Winter came from one moment to another, from one day to another, and berries on bushes froze, and mushrooms which were growing froze, which means that I had a, like a hockey, hockey, hockey stick, like a curved branch, walking through the snow in a very dark night, where I knew that they wouldn't come on horses or searching for us and nobody would walk around in very dark nights in winter time. Uh, I went with, uh, I dug those mushrooms or carried those frozen berries from the bushes and each step I made, I filled snow into my footsteps so that even if they shot me, even if they found me and they would try to find out where I came from, they would not find out uh, because, you know, as I jumped from a UFO or airplane or something like that, uh, they would, people in the shelter would not be discovered. And this way I was coming back and bringing, this was most of our food. The first months, because we believed that we would stay there for one or two weeks, maybe three, four, not seven months, you know, it was 200 days, more than 200 days and nights. Uh, it, then we had a little bit of flour we took with us and some potatoes, which we had to eat raw because the flame and fire would show uh, smoke uh, about trees in the forest and we would be discovered. Which means that we didn't make that mistake. Once we made that mistake, and and a, a, a group of partisans, so Soviet Ukrainian partisans, found us and robbed us and just lined us up to execution. But I didn't have enough time to to tell you all those stories, which uh, uh, happened during those those, those seven, seven months, eventually three years. Uh, and this is what was most of the food I found in the forest. And luckily, uh, they didn't shoot me uh, when we were lined up by those bandits. Uh, I escaped, that's why they didn't shoot them, but they robbed them of everything. Anyway, we made it alive. This was two months before the end of the war. And it was no fun, I can assure you. Try to stay one night in the forest. <laughs> you know, covered with snow and ice. One night, and not 200. And one day. How did you meet your wife? I worked close to Prague, about one hour by train to Prague. And I met her in, I had some dealings in Prague and in the same restaurant uh, she was there with her father and I offered her to show her the most beautiful city you know if you have a chance to see two cities in your lifetime then it should be Jerusalem and Prague Prague has 1000 years of history uh, hundreds of churches 
uh, of, you know, thousand years were a lot of time to build and accumulate, and it was not destroyed. And I offered her to, because I studied in Prague, first of all, for engineering, and then I was coming there once a week to, for my PhD. Uh, and uh, I was showing her for about six hours beautiful Prague. And after that, we started corresponding. Every day I sent her a letter or a postcard, and I, and I was drawing stamps, <laughs> and it was, and post office was stamping, putting a stamp over my my creations, and sometimes neglected to to to, to put a stamp on a on a legal legal stamp. Anyway, uh, about a month or two, she invited me to see her family brothers in Bratislava, which was about five six hours by train. And uh, and then third time I saw her in Prague on the city hall signing papers, uh, papers, uh, wedding wedding papers, which means that this was a very uh, every day we exchanged letters, but we, I saw my wife on my wedding on her wedding uh, third time in my life. And her life. How long have you guys been together? What? How long have you been together? 55 years. In a few months, will be one, one more year. Maybe we have time for one more question. Can you ask a question? Jake, what's your question? How did you know when the war was over? This was a really a very tough thing because, I, as, as I mentioned, the war went five times inside of the forest all around us. Uh, war makes a lot of noise. First of all, when bombs fall from a, uh, an airplane, they make a huge bang. And when it's from a even 100 miles distance and you are very high in the mountains, you can hear it. Which means that then we started recognizing cannon shells. Cannons, cannon is shooting once, and when it ends, when it explodes, uh, then it's a second bang, which is a bang bang. Then, when it comes <coughs> even closer, then you see hear machine gun. Now, and we were under the ground, uh, practically, which is very easy to hear, because the ground is carrying sound better than any than air, and. Uh, this is what happens as the huge noise from the right hand side moved to the left hand side that we were really happy that you know the war might be over and then suddenly well, we were too weak because it, uh, you know exhausted already it was april 1945 then suddenly that same noise started coming from the left back to the right and then from the right to the left, from the left to the right, we had no watches or it was too, too dark under the ground to even know if it was a day or night. And the fifth time it was a total silence. After the war we found out that in the town where we came from, the little town, it, there were two distilleries and uh, both armies were totally exhausted, soldiers discovered there was distilleries, you know, found the alcohol, free alcohol, the whole, you know, drums of it, and got drunk. And Germans killed them, but also got drunk, because it was already a desperate situation, and you know, people were frustrated and you know, tired, young, young man soldiers. And then the Russian killed them, and then it repeated itself until, until finally uh, they surrounded Slovakia, and, and uh, the army ran away to Czech part and then into, into Germany. Uh, after the fifth time, it was a long silence, but we didn't dare to, to show up, to, came, to come out of the shelter. And suddenly we heard somebody in Slovak shouting, Spitzis, we know you are somewhere here, if you are alive, show up, war is over. Problem is that during those hiding, a lot of people, uh, even those people on the horseback who tried to kill us, 
were shouting help, 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 and some people who, who were curious uh, stuck out their head and, and they were dead in a moment. She said we didn't trust them. But my mother recognized voices and then through the little opening we were walking in and out at church. And we, uh, she recognized the peasants from the village, uh, which was close about a mile from the shelter. And uh, we crawled out and they told us, you know, come with us because, because it's a mine field on the left by Germans and the mines on the uh, right, uh, you know, like made by partisans, guerrillas, which lived in the same forest, uh, huge forest. You know. And uh, we couldn't stand, uh, we couldn't walk. And they brought us some bread and water and uh, then we went back to the small village and then back home by hitting the ground in front of us in case uh, in mine would explode, uh, the first person closest to the stick would, would blow up, but then the rest would, would survive. And this nothing blew up, we all survived and we all moved back home and this was it. But uh, when I looked at those peasants who were very tough, you know, in the mountains like that, uh, if a child died, they would, they would cry. But if a horse died or a cow, they knew that without the horse and cow they would perish. They would just starve. They would cry. But they were crying when watching us coming out of that hole, you know, fungus on us, clay, uh, you know, like uh, skeletons, just eyes glowing. Uh, which means that I was impressed and I was really understood that there are some good people in the world. And, my soul returned to me and I remained a human being, not a frustrated, you know, like an uh, angry, angry person. Uh, and I still keep that spirit. Thank you. So. <laughs> to Mr. and Mrs. Fitz for coming in and sharing their story with us and just letting us know their experiences. We are honored and very touched to hear your story, so thank you. I hope you learned something and just be courageous. And my advice is don't cry over the spilled milk, bring a cat. <laughs> Even out of, the, out of the worst experience, learn something and go on living and keep smiling. There's no other way. 